I am uh, Patty Smith and I work for the Bonnie Vale Environmental Education Center and we have been organizing salamander crossing brigades for many, many years now. It's, oh heavens, as long as you guys have been crossing salamanders, I'm sure. Um, and I'm going to turn off some lights and get started. Do you want to talk about... Well, we could just take a minute and say the, the peak, this information on Bonnie Vale right here. <coughs> I'll talk about these salamander crossing handouts okay as we go along but every single thing we do these days we if you see this bug in your woods not this big it's not is this big <laughs> you see one that big called SWAT team or something but um, anyway we want everybody to recognize this bug so that's so we want everybody to join us in educating people because this is the Asian longhorn beetle and to if we find it the chances are good that we can get rid of an infestation. But um, they've had good luck with that. But if we don't, they could really destroy our maple trees. And that would be tragic. Have there been any reports in this area? No. Confirmed reports? No, but it's close. It is in Worcester, Massachusetts. Yeah, right. yeah. So. Sometimes when I tell people that I organize salamander crossing brigades, they say, oh, yes, isn't that wonderful? I love those little orange things. And they're, they're thinking about our, our red Fs, the red F stage of our red spotted newts, the most common, well, the most commonly seen salamander in the woods around here. But any kid who grew up in Vermont, am I right, has seen lots and lots of bees and lots and lots of bees. Any proper rock turning, log turning kid is going to have seen many red back salamanders. This little guy right here. Very, very common salamanders. But by gosh, you can go for years without seeing one of these. And when you see one for the first time, you say, oh my god, I didn't know we had dragons here. They're just amazing salamanders, these gigantic black salamanders with their yellow polka dots. And the reason we don't see them is because they're a member of a group called the mole salamanders. They are subterranean salamanders. They spend all year underground under the leaf litter. They need a very dark, moist environment or they become desiccated. So the only time we reliably get to see them is that one time of year. Right about now, when we get warm rains and the soil profile changes. Think about this. You're one of these salamanders, kind of dormant underground most of the winter. And if you were to go deeper and deeper into the soil during the winter, it would get warmer and warmer the farther down you go. But at some point in the spring, the soil is going to warm up enough so that the farther up you go, the warmer it gets. And I think that's one of the triggers that gets these guys moving. So when that happens, when there's that thermal shift in the soil, and it's nice and moist and very dark, they head out to their breeding habitat. And this is just for, you know, a couple weeks. The rest of the year, they're underground. So they have to go at night because they'd be shocked if they came out in broad daylight. So the breeding habitat are vernal pools. At least that's what we call them in Vermont. <laughs> and the, the qualities of vernal pools that are the most successful, the most productive for these salamanders are ones that are in the woodland so that they have some shade. And also a lot of leaf litter on the bottom because it's that leaf litter that provides the nourishment for all of these amphibians and other organisms that live in vernal pools. Small size because strangely enough, the organisms that live there actually count on them drying up at least most years or at least some years. Um, isolated from other permanent bodies of water and they have to hold water long enough for all these amphibians and other things that breed in them to mature. And this is, this is why these animals have adapted to this crazy um, unsettled habitat. It's to avoid things like this, the real predators of little aquatic beings. So there aren't any fish in vernal pools. That's the most important definition of what makes a vernal pool. Um, no bullfrogs. Bullfrog tadpoles actually have to spend a whole winter in the pond, so any body of water that dries up periodically is not going to have a resident population of bullfrogs, although, oh, a, a good industrious bullfrog is going to find its way to a vernal pool in the spring. 
and have a little feast of salamander larvae, but there aren't going to be anywhere near as many of them. So these vernal pools provide really essential habitat for a whole suite of creatures that have evolved to take advantage of this, this seasonal drying phenomenon. Including these little guys here. If you go to a vernal pool in the middle of the summer and it's dry, and you say, hmm, this looks like it could be a vernal pool, dig around in the leaf litter and you're going to find these teeny tiny clams, little white clams that are smaller than your pinky fingernail. And that's a, that's a giveaway. They live just in vernal pools. If you go there right now, you might see some of these guys, fairy shrimp. They're about an inch long and live in these vernal pools. And in order to complete their life cycle, their eggs actually have to freeze at some point and dry up at some point. And they remain viable for many years, at least 15. But these guys, these guys are why we organize salamander crossing brigades. The spotted salamanders. And you're, you're really not gonna mistake them for anything else. But uh, these are the field markings, gray to black in color, six to nine inches long, these very handsome yellow polka dots. And they have a broad snout. I think myself, although I'm not positive about this, you'll see some out there when you're crossing them that are that have big fat heads and big fat bodies, and I think those are the females. And, uh, did I say that these guys can live for 20 years? Yeah. That's, uh, they're extremely long-lived and, and therefore have very stable populations. Each adult salamander is a very important member of the breeding population because very few of the young ones survive long enough to breed. They are uh, three to five years old before they make their first trek from the upland, from the soil to their breeding pools. But when they get there, imagine you've been under the ground sleeping all winter and you're going to be under the ground all by yourself the rest of the year. They're solitary creatures. When they get to the vernal pool, they gather in these great seething masses called congresses. And this is, it's, it's really a pool party. So they gather in huge numbers and this is what gets them excited enough to breed. The males deposit these little things on the bottom of the pool. They're called spermatophores. It's just a little jelly pedestal with a little packet of sperm on top. And then they lure the female salamanders over to. Some people say their very own spermatophores. Other people say, well, just in the general direction of a bunch of spermatophores. But when, anyhow, it, it tends to work out. And the females scoop this up and fertilize their eggs internally and lay their eggs. And this is what spotted salamander eggs look like in pools. They lay these big clusters. Each ball is probably from a single female. And they can have up to 150 eggs in them. And they come in a few different color varieties. These milky ones here are perfectly viable. And when you pick them up out of the pool like this, they have a very firm layer of jelly encasing them. And it's a, it's a layer that covers all of the individual eggs. And this is the, one of the milky ones. And eventually those little eggs turn into little wriggly things. These guys are probably just about to hatch. And when they do, they don't have legs at all. This one's a little bit older, but they do have these feathery gills that they breathe through. They're completely aquatic for this first stage of their life. And this one is, of course, standing on a fingernail clam. And they will eventually turn into these little tiny, tiny versions of the terrestrial salamanders. I took some of these egg masses inside to hatch them out, and these little guys did not turn into miniature salamanders until sometime in October. So this is another little um, point of interest with this vernal pool life is that everything is very temperature dependent. And I think the water in vernal pools must get really warm, especially right before it evaporates completely. And that temperature really speeds up the development of these little guys. So we have, oh gosh, how to characterize them. We really have 
two mole salamanders you're going to see reliably around here. We have the spotted salamander and we have the Jefferson salamander and the Jefferson complex hybrids because there are sort of three kinds of mole salamanders around here. Very occasionally you'll see a pure blue spotted salamander and we'll get to them next. But the blue spotted and Jeffersons have been hybridizing for years and they've got this very, very, very complicated genetic arrangement. These, most of the Jeffersons you see now are really hybrids, Jefferson complex hybrids, and they may have um, three, four, five, six sets of chromosomes instead of the usual two of most animals. Anyway, these guys are a bit smaller than the spotted salamanders, and they're much, much more slender, brown to gray in color, and this light blue flecking on their bellies and toes, up to seven inches long. The head is widest behind the eyes there, and the tail is laterally compressed like a rudder, which is not the case. Let's see how far we have to go back to show you a big spotted. All right, we'll remember to show you one up ahead. So yeah, that narrow tail is also characteristic of these guys. And they're rare in Vermont. They're very rare, although in Dummerston in particular, uh, they're, they're probably more abundant in Dummerston than any other place in Vermont. And I think it's because of the Waits River formation, the bedrock that runs in a band from somewhere in Massachusetts, actually all the way up through the state but it's because of the way the, the crossings and pools are in Dummerston that most of these guys show up. And um, it's because the Waits River Formation bedrock has a lot of calcium in it that provides buffering to the vernal pools, so they're more alkaline than a lot of other vernal pools, which seems to be something that these particular salamanders need. So you will see Jefferson salamanders around here, especially if you happen to be crossing on Waits River bedrock. And this is what they look like, very handsome salamanders. If you see one of these guys, especially if you're at a new site, take a picture. Um, the state really loves to get pictures of Jefferson salamanders. And if, you, if you're out crossing salamanders and see anything that you can't identify or you think is unusual, take a picture or anything that's really cool. We love pictures. So this is a blue spotted salamander and I've seen a couple of these. They are, again, smaller than the Jefferson but tend to be a little bit chunkier than the Jefferson. And they have got these blue polka dots all over, not just concentrated along the belly but all over like that What's that enamelware, old tin enameled yeah. dishware? Yeah. You've yeah. all seen it. So yeah, that's this is the blue spotted salamander. And this is a juvenile that I found actually, actually on Miller Road in Dummerston, right where the wetland has been drained. So there may no longer be breeding habitat for this blue spotted salamander. Ugh me how that happens. Another I have baby blue spotted salamander. Now this is in here to confuse you. This strange thing, this great big fat salamander is a spotted salamander with no spots. You're never ever going to see a Jefferson salamander or a blue spotted salamander this big. If you see something this big with no spots, it's spotted. And this is what, um, what I mean when I say the females are the ones that I think have these big fat heads and big fat bodies. Um, Jim Andrews is the state herpetologist. He's coming down to do a program on uh, reptiles and amphibians to look out for in your towns. You can ask him if the, the females are fat or he would know. This is that same salamander got some strange pigment things going on. So the eggs of the Jefferson and blue spotted complex salamanders have this, are in a very liquidy sausage shaped egg mass and you can't really tell when they're in the water you have to pick them up and, and you'll see that it's like jello that hasn't set. 
And they typically have something like 30 eggs in an egg mess. Very sausage shape, and again, attached to sticks. And here they are developing away. Going to become little salamanders one day. And these guys, of course, we heard at the very beginning, wood frogs tend to tell you where the vernal pools are. And these guys are really little frogs, just one to two and a half inches long. They've got this dark bandit mask, and they are the color of, of the leaf litter on the forest floor. And uh, have, has anyone ever seen them while out walking in the woods? You almost never actually spot them unless they hop, is that right? Did you see it when it hopped? Um, well, to me, the wood frogs are just American toes. Yeah, they're both, they're, right? they're, they're both very terrestrial and they're both colored the same way, but if you see one of these in the woods and you see it hop, that's how you know where it went, and then it's very easy to just lose them in the leaf litter again. Uh, dorsolateral ridges, now these identification features are important for all of you who are going to be crossing salamanders because it would be very handy for us if you can identify what you're seeing and send in a report. So dorsolateral ridges are found on some frogs and not others and it's this little ridge that runs down the back and wood frogs have them. <laughs> it's really fun to cross wood frogs. The males especially sit up right in the road and they look very eager and they are very eager and you can pick them up and um, some of them will be so excited to be picked up that they'll cling to your fingers and you'll have to pluck them off your fingers to put them down on the side of the road again. The female wood frogs are bigger and more red color than the males and you can usually see that their bellies are a bit swollen with eggs. And uh, that's the big female on the bottom and they mate by having the male grab the female, and sometimes you'll see piles of males on one female. Oh my gosh, it's quite a scene. It's quite a scene. Um, and as she lays the eggs, he fertilizes them. And this is the wood frog egg mass. Each frog lays one big, sort of like a softball size mass, and you'll see it doesn't have that thick outer coating of jelly that the mole salamander eggs have. It looks like tapioca. And these egg masses disintegrate pretty quickly. Within 10 days to two weeks, they'll turn into a sheet on top of the pools. And, and uh, shortly after that, they hatch out. And at first, they just look like little commas swimming around or lying on the bottom of the pool. And at this stage, they're just eating algae and things like that, nice little, mostly herbivores. <coughs> but they quickly turn into little froglets and can become a bit carnivorous at this stage. So if you are a teacher that has a tank full of them in your classroom, better be prepared to have some population decrease before they metamorphose. Um, back when we were doing a, a vernal pool mapping project in Demerston, we had a wonderful intern from Antioch who did some research on wood frogs and she mapped a whole bunch of vernal pools and in that two week period, over the course of a couple of springs, she counted every wood frog egg mass and, and developed a population census for wood frogs um, east of the West River in Dummerston. So they, she counted 9,094 egg masses and based on other, other folks' research, she estimated there were 626 eggs per mass, giving us, gosh, 5,692,844 wood frog tadpoles. And uh, approximately 200 of those successfully metamorphosed into froglets. It's a brutal world, even in the vernal pools. And let's see, 85% of frogs that breed are one year old, so she's now guessing how many survive. Then only 16,000 of these, goodness gracious, 200,000 frogs made it to breed the next year. So really what that tells you is not just that lots and lots of little wood frogs don't make it, 
but that lots and lots and lots of other things that eat wood frogs have had meals out there. And that's one of the great things about vernal pools. They're just pumping all of this biomass out into the forest to feed it's, it. It's great unless you're a wood frog. It's great unless you're a wood frog. <laughs> it's tough if you're a wood frog, but yes. The other little frogs that you're gonna see crossing on these rainy nights in April are spring peepers, and these guys are really tiny, and these guys are why it's really important to have a bright light when you're out there. Um, so they're one to one and a half inches long, and also they're terrestrial frogs, so they're colored like leaf litter. You can see this X-shaped mark on their back. You can see they kind of have a brown mask too, but it bleeds right down their side. And they do not have that dorsolateral ridge that the wood frogs have. And they are, well, they used to be official tree frogs, but now they're just pseudo tree frogs. They have these little, little pads on their toes, adhesive pads, so they can go right up vegetation very easily. This is the belly side as it goes right up some glass. And you can see that X shape on the back of this little guy pretty clearly. Four toes in the front and three in the back? Um, I think there are four in the back. You know, no. I, I don't know what the like frog toe last. count is. Oh, did it? Oh, oh, right, perfect. Well, it may have some toes folded over. Ah, uh -huh. uh, yes, the spotted salamander. So, salamander crossing brigades. You may think it's just this thing that crazy people do, but, but you're here, so you may not think that. It, it is, of course, the best opportunity to actually see these amazing salamanders that you really hardly ever see the rest of the year. But it's also a very important activity from an ecological perspective, especially when you're dealing with a, a very rare species like the blue spotted or the Jeffersons. Um, blue spotted and Jeffersons are, they have a, the same range and it's really the eastern, northeastern United States and southern Canada. And I don't think they're very abundant anywhere in that range, so these guys are, are really important salamanders. There was a, an interesting study done by a couple of guys named Gibbs and Shriver from the State University of New York in the Berkshires in the 90s. They were trying to estimate um, if road mortality in the Berkshires, which is has similar development to what we have around here, would impact the population of these vernal pool breeding amphibians. So they studied spotted salamanders and they were able to determine that um, if road mortality caused more than 20% decrease in the population, that population of spotted salamanders would disappear within 25 years. If it was 10% mortality, that population would adapt and could continue to thrive, but once it hit that 20% threshold, according to their models anyway, um, probably wouldn't be able to adapt and would gradually decline and disappear. So it's not just kind of a fun, crazy thing to do. It's, it could potentially be really important for the long-term existence of these vernal pool breeding amphibians. Now, let's see, this is not gonna play. Oh, maybe it will. So at Bonneville, uh, we've been working on a salamander app, and these are a couple of videos we put together for the app. And maybe it'll be better. All right, I'm just going to try and play it. Each spring, spotted salamanders, wood frogs, and other amphibians migrate to their breeding habitat. The vernal pools and ponds their species have used for hundreds or perhaps thousands of years. Superimposed upon this ancient world, however, is a newer world of roads and cars. In areas where salamanders, frogs, and toads are forced to cross even moderately busy roads, populations of these animals are likely to disappear. Helping amphibians safely negotiate road crossings is imperative to their long-term survival. 
Here's where you come in. Become a salamander crossing guard. Helping salamanders is fun, but it's also important. It happens on rainy nights in late March and throughout the month of April when temperatures are above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Salamanders wait until it's quite dark to move. Frogs may begin at dusk. Conditions can be difficult to predict. Sometimes it rains in the early afternoon but stays warm and humid throughout the evening. Or it's raining but cold. Sign up for Beak's Salamander Hotline and we'll send you email alerts with our best predictions of when to go out. You will need these things. Rain gear, at least some part of which should be light colored. A reflective vest and other reflective materials such as a reflective armband or just reflective tape stuck to your clothing. A flashing clip-on light. A bright flashlight with fresh batteries. Bright lights can vastly increase your efficiency at finding and moving salamanders. Some volunteers have learned the hard way that an ordinary flashlight, especially one with waning batteries, might not reveal amphibians until you're <clears throat> upon them. If, on the other hand, you have a bright enough light, you can clearly see all amphibian movement over a large swath of road and can move quickly and confidently. Don't wait for the rain to start. Make sure you have a bright light and enough bulbs and batteries to keep it bright. You won't be sorry and the salamanders will thank you. An example of a good flashlight is a lantern like this that uses a six volt lantern battery. Your typical 2D cell flashlight is probably adequate as long as it has fresh alkaline batteries. These small LED lights can be bright, but you'll find that the light isn't penetrating enough to help you see amphibians on the road. Headlamps are helpful, but you'll need a flashlight too. Make sure your hands are clean with no lotion or hand sanitizer. Salamanders readily absorb chemicals through their skin. The following items are also recommended. Salamander crossing signs help alert motorists to your activities. A spatula can be helpful for removing dead amphibians from the road so you don't count them twice while you're collecting data. And finally, a clean bucket is often used by volunteers when they have to move many salamanders at once. So you've received the alert, you know where you're going, you have your supplies, the night has come. Salamanders usually don't begin their trek until it is dark. Frogs may begin at dusk. Because few of them live right next to the road, it may take some time for them to arrive at the crossing zone. Because any driving after dark must be done slowly, consider arriving at your site before dark. Time to read that book that's been on your list. If conditions are good but you see no salamanders, be prepared to wait. Often salamanders don't show up until after 9 p.m. If there's a site coordinator or other volunteers, check in. You can decide how best to cover the site and share data collection. Then, with a bright light, stride briskly along your stretch of road, sweeping the light from side to side. Always check the area by your feet when changing direction or resuming activity. It may take a number of passes to identify the crossing zone. Most crossing hotspots are about two-tenths of a mile in length, though more diffuse movement happens over longer stretches of road. When you find an amphibian, pick it up gently and move it across the road in the direction it was heading. If you're not sure, move it in the direction most of the other amphibians have been moving in. Keep your feet on the street. Since salamanders are very difficult to see once they're off the road, don't step off the road unless a car is passing. 
While getting salamanders safely across the road is our priority, keeping track of the numbers of amphibians and species observed will help us monitor population trends and organize crossing brigades more effectively. Fill out the data form and submit it. Cars pose hazards to humans as well as amphibians. Crossing guards assist salamanders on rainy and sometimes foggy nights with the goal of keeping cars from hitting amphibians, a potentially dangerous mix. Please protect yourselves, motorists, and the amphibian crossing program by being prepared with safety gear in advance of migration nights. Traffic usually stops by 10.30 on weeknights or by 11.30 on Friday and Saturday, depending on your site. Your own schedule dictates what time you at home. Most crossing guards leave when the traffic slows. Check under your car for amphibians before you drive away and remember to drive slowly on your way home. So if you know of anyone else who'd like to be a salamander crossing guard, all the information essentially that you need to do it is at the BEEP website. So uh, just to reiterate, it's great to have all this gear together before the rain actually comes. Nothing like scrambling around the house the last minute saying, oh, do we have any batteries for the flashlight, dear? Um, have it all ready by the door. Again, the conditions for migration, it should be rainy or very wet because again, these salamanders and amphibians will desiccate very quickly if it's not wet, so it needs to be quite wet. And after dark, especially for the spotted salamanders and Jeffersons, although the frogs might begin at dusk, uh, the ground has to be thawed, and movement is more likely after we've had some really warm days, like at least 60 degrees. Or uh, some researchers have found that after three consecutive days when it's been above 40 during the day, it might be enough to get them going. And the air temperatures of 40 degrees or higher at dusk, typically required. We've had these years, and every year is different, and every year is weird. Um, when there hasn't been any rain until the end of April, and by then the amphibians are so desperate they'll go if the humidity is high. So you kind of have to, it's a, it's a good reason to sign up for the email alerts, because I will let you know what's happened already and what's likely to happen given the conditions. And this is the data sheet. I've got a bunch of them here. If anyone would like to take some data sheets home and be prepared for salamander crossing, uh, what it requires is that you're able to identify these species here. So we're just gonna do a little quiz for you. You've seen the, the species now that are commonly seen at our crossing sites. So we just, just do whatever system works well for you. Usually hatch marks are a quick, easy way to do it. If you're overwhelmed with lots of Migrating amphibians, don't worry about keeping an accurate count. Just get the darn things across. Um, you also might see these guys, the eastern redback salamanders we were talking about earlier. And they are really tiny and they're really, really, really hard to pick up. It's handy to have that spatula or a piece of paper or something. You can see how tiny their legs are. And to get underneath it, a wriggly little salamander, especially on asphalt. Oh, yeah, crazy. And I've heard that you're not supposed to touch them on your skin. Only if you've got chemicals on your skin. We do, it's, your hands are going to be wet while you're out there in the rain, and they should be wet and they shouldn't have any chemicals on them, but um, if that's the case, then you're okay picking them up, if you can. Um, the belly on these guys, and this, you'll see why this is important in a minute, is uh, salt and pepper speckled like granite. And these are just very petite little salamanders. The eastern newt has got this kind of granular skin, and it's the only bright orange thing you're going to see out there. And this is the, the immature terrestrial phase of the, of the newt that you see, the green salamander swimming in all the ponds around here. And they're not migrating to breeding habitat. They can spend many years, five to seven years on land and in this phase before they become fully aquatic for the rest of their lives. 
What if you see them crossing the road? Yeah, if you see them crossing the road, get them out of the road. Jeez, guys, get out of the road. Um, and in whichever direction it seems they're moving in. The American toe should be pretty obvious. It's that squat, lumpy thing with the short legs and these big parotid glands behind the eyes. And I'm giving you all these other details because if you live in Vernon, there's a small, small chance that you might see the other extremely rare toad that can be found in Vermont. So the American toad has got these rows of dark black spots down its back. And in each of those spots, you'll see one or two largish warts. And on the belly, there are these black spots. If you see a fowler's toad, which is the other unusual toad, on the dark spots down its back, there are multiple small warts. See, five or six, three little warts. And the belly is pure white with maybe one dark spot on the chest. So if you see a toad that looks like that, check its belly and take a picture. Why are they so rare? They're a southern toad. This is the northern extent of their range. Just that hat. Yeah. I, I used yeah. to live in Maryland and they were really common. Yeah, fowlers. Yeah, we would see uh, hundreds of migrating juveniles. They're about that long. Nice. Why? And did you hear them too? They had this kind of weird, obnoxious, can you imitate it? No. Oh, come on. It's, a, yeah. it's like a wah, wah, something and like the, that anyway. The juveniles look kind of like uh, spring peepers, but it's oh, yeah. July, you know? It's like, huh. what are they doing here in July? Yeah. <laughs> How many of you have seen a gray tree frog? I think so. These guys are, it's like the spotted salamanders when you see one. They are so weird and you just never see them because they live in the trees and they look like bark. They look like lichen. Uh, they're perfectly camouflaged. Um, but they will come out and, and breed in pretty much any still water. They tend to come out later in the season. It needs to be nice and warm. So if you have a very late migration at your site, uh, say, the very end of April and it's really warm, or May, you might see these guys at your crossing site. And they are just the coolest little frogs. Again, they're little frogs, one to two inches long. They're a bit bigger than peepers. Um, and they've got yellow on their legs. So watch for these guys. They're, they're bumpy like toads, but they are frogs and they're true tree frogs. You can see the big adhesive discs on their toes. You're going to see these guys out hopping around too, but they're, again, they're not moving to breeding habitat. They're, they're really aquatic frogs. They're affiliated with some body of water somewhere. And they've got that dorsolateral ridge and a bright green upper lip, but they come in all kinds of variations of color aside from that. They could be bright green all over. White belly, bright green lip, dorsolateral ridge is going to be a green frog. Bullfrog, our biggest frog, does not have dorsolateral ridges. It looks, it's got kind of this eyeglass thing going on where it's got the earpiece that bends down around its eardrum and also have a green upper lip. At my site in Marlboro, strangely enough, I have seen more pickerel frogs than anything else. Pickerel frogs are grassland frogs and they have these nice, handsome, rectangular, dark splotches down their back and these banded legs, and their bellies will be bright yellow and the inside of their legs. So they're not moving to breeding habitat either, but you might see them. That's another pickerel frog. Okay, so this is why I wanted you to think about the, the belly of the red-backed salamander. This is a, a very little documented salamander. We're not sure if it's really rare or not, but the four-toed salamander looks a lot like the red-backed, but it has this white belly with black flecks, and uh, we would just love to have this salamander documented in Wyndham County. 
So, so it, it looks like what? Which salamander? It looks, looks like the red back, that little one that's really hard to pick up. So about the same size. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And this is the belly. Um, marbled salamander is another salamander that has not yet been documented in Vermont, but it's been documented just south of us. And this is another mole salamander. It's shorter than the spotted. It's just a four inch long salamander, but it's nice and fat and chunky. And they go to vernal pools in the fall and lay their eggs there. And then when the water fills the pool in the spring, the eggs become viable. So look for that guy. I think it's actually found in New Hampshire across from us. So it ought to be here. If you see anything that looks like that, take a picture. Did you, did you say they breed in the fall? Yeah. They lay their eggs in vernal pools in the fall, even if the pools are dry. They know where to go. And so that will be one that we look for now. Well, you know, it might just be out wandering around. So, yeah, keep an eye out. So here's your, your quiz. We have two frogs here. This one and this one, they're different. Which one is this one? Go ahead, say it. Green frog. Yes. <laughs> yes, green frog has got that dorsolateral ridge, and the bullfrog has got the eyeglass thing. And that just shows you some color variations with those frogs. Who's this? Heft. Yes. Yes. And this they, guy. They have the dry, scaly skin, right? The Fs, yeah. 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 And this guy? You can't they see the belly, but. Red back. Yeah, that's a red back. Marble soul. Yes. This one's tricky. Yeah, that's a wood frog. No it's got the mask, and you can just see those dorsal lateral ridges, and you can tell that it's really, really eager to get to a vernal pool. <laughs> oh, let's see who's in this picture. Ooh. Spotted. Spotted. Is there three? There are three spotted salamanders and one Jefferson. But it kind of gives you the idea of how hard they can be to see on wet leaf litter, especially. Hmm. American toad. Oh, jeez, it's labeled at the bottom. That's cheating. <laughs> but yeah, that's an American toad. It's got those big warts in the black spots. What? Wood frost. Yeah, wood frost. Wood frost. Jefferson? Yes, Jefferson? <sighs> Oh, beautiful spotted salamanders. So, I'm really hoping that you'll all go out there and help them cross. It'll be very thrilling. You'll get to see these amazing amphibians. I'm just going to take you to the Bonnyvale website so you know it's there. Org. We love to post your pictures on our website. Here are those two videos um, and some basic instructions. If you want to choose a site, you can open up the, our Google map and uh, zoom in, figure out where you are, and Where the nearest sites are to you, they're color coded and various other kinds of coatings. Um, near the school on Greg Road, you can download a paper map. So that's on the website. Oops. Um, you can submit your data electronically by clicking there. Sheets, but since you're here, I happen to have these very nice laminated ID sheets, the salamanders and frogs and toads for anyone who wants one. 
Hawaii. And also, for your bumper, promote Salamander Crossing Brigade. We have some nice bumper stickers. Help yourself to those and help yourself to data sheets. And um, for anyone who would like to know more about the different sites, uh, here are the different maps that you can download for any of the towns around here, any of the sites we know about. I'm also keenly interested in any sites you know of that we don't know about. Um, so I will wrap it up right there, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about the best site to go to near you or anything else. And thank you very much for coming. Yeah. This is about there.